You know, I want to, first of all, welcome all who are guests among us. All of you who are new to our Bolingbrook campus, welcome to the Compass Church. Everybody at South Naperville, new folks at Wheaton and Hobson, so glad that you're here. And you should know that last weekend was a historic moment in our journey together as a church. Uh, we were one church at four locations, and we believe that God has called us to this huge task of raising $10 million, half a million to be invested in ministry partners here, near, and far, but the rest of it going to building a brand new building for our South Naperville campus, the only of our campuses in a rental scenario. And so last weekend was this outpouring of generosity through commitment cards. And uh, friends, it was remarkable. It was the single greatest day of generosity in the 67-year history of our church. And uh, everybody's so excited to hear, and now I'm going to disappoint you big time. I'm not going to tell you what the total is. (laughs) Here's the deal. Uh, After last weekend, more cards kept coming in through the week. You know, we realized that some of you weren't here last week and you were out of town or you were ill and we don't want you missing out on the opportunity to be a part of it. And so we've set aside the weekend, two weeks from this weekend, it's December 6th and 7th. Uh, This has been part of the plan, by the way. If you look in the back of the Rise Up notebook, you'll see on the back cover, inside of the back cover, it says that this is a celebration weekend, the weekend when we will share the the news. And so this gives opportunity for all of you to get in on it. And quite honestly, we need you. Here, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Are you ready? The, the exciting news is though the goal, $10 million, is so big, we are very close. We're, we're not there yet, but we're very close. In fact, we believe that if we see what we hope is, you know, some more coming in in these next couple of weeks, uh, we're, we're going to reach our goal. So would you uh, be prayerful and, and excited and anticipated? Uh, you know, a great celebration on the, the 6th and 7th. Can I just give you a little bit more details? Um, last weekend, there were over 1,000 commitment cards turned in. If you think about that, in most cases, it's a family that's turning in a commitment card. And if your average family's three people, that's over 3,000 people saying, we're going to rise up and be a part of this great thing God's doing in our church, which blows me away. Last weekend, we had commitments for the largest financial gifts in the history of our church. Never have we seen gifts of that size. But maybe the smaller gifts that God's most excited about, one comes to mind. My son Jake, 12 years old, was sitting with my wife, and when the moment came for turning in these cards, Jake goes to Jen, Mom, how much do I got? And uh, Jen was like, what do, you, what do you mean? How much money do I have? And he's asking his net worth, you know? And so Jen <laughs> reflected on it and said, Jake, uh, you've got about $200. He says, can I give one to this? And Jen wasn't sure what he meant by that, but she said, hey, it's your money. You can do with it whatever you want. And Jake very carefully took a commitment card and he wrote his name down and then he wrote $100. My boy gave away half his net worth. How about that, huh? (laughs) Can you read that? And he did so with enthusiasm, bringing a... Smile to his father's face, more importantly, his heavenly father's face. God is moving in all of us. And we have exciting days of anticipation and celebration ahead. All right. Speaking of celebration, here we are in our last week in this study of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah and his friends have rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. And they determine that this is a moment, chapter 12 of Nehemiah is all about Thanksgiving. How perfect as we approach Thanksgiving this Thursday. Together, you ready? Let's learn the art of giving thanks. I I contend all of us have big growth in this area that's needed. And when we grow in this art, when we get good at it, Brings glory to God and untold joy to our hearts. 
And so we return to Nehemiah, now chapter 12, looking at verse 27. It says, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving. There it is. Friends, they said this wall is such a huge win. The, the city of Jerusalem had a wall that was lying in ruins, disgrace to the people of God, disgrace to the name of God, but it's been finished. And they said, we're going to have a party, a jubilee, a parade with musicians and singers and dancing and celebrating this great win. And, and so they were told to celebrate joyfully. Let's highlight that. Friends, uh, are you ready to celebrate joyfully this week, this Thanksgiving? Maybe you say, Jeff, I'd love to, but if you understood my life, you'd realize that's not going to happen. Uh, I've got major problems. I've got tragic pain in my life. I have got loss. I have got disappointment. I have got situations that preclude me from celebrating joyfully. Now, you may say, if I were in Jerusalem where everything is perfect, I mean, they're living the glory days. Of course they celebrated because everything was so great. No, 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 no. That's where you're wrong. Something you've got to understand that we need to understand is that when they decided to celebrate, things in Jerusalem were not great. Yes, they had a new wall, and that was great. But the overall picture was still disastrous. In fact, here's what I want to do. We're going to be in Nehemiah 12, but for a moment I want to go back to Nehemiah 11, the preceding chapter, take a look at a couple verses there to gain understanding of what life in Jerusalem was like. Here's Nehemiah 11, 1 and 2. The people cast lots. This is a lottery system, a draft, if you will. To bring one out of every ten of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own hometowns. Now the people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Friends, the conditions in Jerusalem were so bad, they had to have a mandatory forced relocation project where this lottery was done and one out of 10 people, they said, I'm sorry, your name was drawn. You have to move into Jerusalem. The few people who did it voluntarily were commended as doing something heroic. And you say, why? Here's why. Though the wall has been rebuilt, the buildings, the houses are still in rubble, complete disaster. Here's a list of hardships. Squalor, if you moved to Jerusalem, you were going to be living in a tent and trying to use the broken pieces to make suitable living arrangements. So their housing was subpar, to say the least. There was recession, financial hardships. We discover upon careful inspection that there is a famine at this time. Adding to the famine, they had been distracted from their farming businesses as they worked on the wall. And so with that neglect of their farm, the year of farming was terrible. Financially, it was a disaster. Anybody relate to hard times financially? There was unrest, though they would love to say, now that we got the wall, there's great peace. The truth is that the enemies that we've heard about were still threatening war. And so hard times were still a real possibility leading to anxiety and worry. Anybody relate to anxiety and worry? There was discrimination. Friends, the Jews were being oppressed. It's important to remember that at this time, they don't have their freedom. There is a, an empire, the Persian Empire, that is oppressing these guys as a, a, a overruled people. And being Jewish in a Persian Empire was a very difficult experience. And so that's the reality. And yet, going to the next slide, they said, we're going to celebrate joyfully. Friends, this is amazing. They made plans and executed with excellence the desire to find great joy and celebration in the midst of dire circumstances. And we say, how do you do that? 
Good question. Let's learn from them, shall we? I see three steps in this plan here. And the first is this, don't wait. Can't you imagine some saying, hey, this notion of a parade and big festival is a great idea, but look at Jerusalem. (laughs) We're in no condition to celebrate. Let's try to rebuild these houses, these other buildings. The day will come later when we'll be happy and ready for this. And the leader said, no, we will not wait. In fact, we're not going to wait for the Levites to come on their own. We're going to seek them out and tell them now's the time. You got to come. We're not waiting for you to be inclined. We're telling you, today's the day. And I would encourage us to have that same perspective. It's so easy to say someday. When this happens, then I will be happy. To delay joy. To postpone celebration. Isn't that true? We say to ourselves, well, this is just kind of hard, you know. When I get well, then I'll be happy. When I pass this class, then I'll be happy. When I get out of debt, then we'll celebrate. When I'm an empty nester and get these kids out of the house, then I'll have joy, you know? We're always looking for the next phase of life as the time when there'll be reason for celebration. Don't do that. Don't put off joy. Don't delay Thanksgiving. Do it now. You say, but there's still rubble. In the midst of the rubble, Choose to celebrate. And you're like, how do I do that? Here's the key. Find beauty. Did you notice this? Celebrate joyfully the recession? No, that's not worthy of celebration. Celebrate joyfully the rubble? No. Celebrate joyfully the dedication. Dedication of what? The dedication of the wall. That's reason for celebration. Yes, there's a lot of bad things. But if you see past the rubble to the wall, there is something good in the midst of the chaos. And that wall was a great blessing of God and one worthy of celebrating. Friends, we got rubble and we got walls in our lives. We've got the bad, but if you have eyes to see, we've also got good. Most of us tend to be so preoccupied by the problems, we've grown blind to the good. And one of the keys to having a heart filled with joy and thanksgiving is finding the beauty that's worthy of celebrating. Uh, You know, one example comes to mind right now. Maybe you're, like me, a Bears fan, all right? So let's connect to this picture for a moment, all right? This was a moment in the fourth quarter of last week's game. This is Mitch Trubisky, the new young quarterback on the Bears, and this is the coach, Nagy giving him a private conversation. Do you remember what this talk was about? Uh, He was telling him, Mitch, I'm putting you on the bench. You're our starting quarterback, but no longer. I'm bringing the backup quarterback in. What a humiliating conversation. You say, it looks like more than that. Oh, Yeah, so Nagy's also saying, Mitch, I'm going to tell the world you have a hurt hip. Just run with me on this one, okay? Uh, And sit on the bench. And so... Mitch Trubisky was benched. Mitch Trubisky may, I don't know, but he may this Thanksgiving say, I have no reason to give thanks. I'm living a nightmare. I came in as the second pick overall. I mean, they bet the farm on me. They, I was to be the first good quarterback in the Bears forever. And I... Could not have had higher expectations. And Mitch is saying, I have let the entire city of Chicago down. I am living a nightmare. No thanksgiving. Is that true? I mean, yeah, all that's true. But (laughs) there's also other truth that if I could whisper in Mitch's ear, I would. I would say this. I'd say, Mitchell, you are 25 years old and financially set for life. (laughs) Mitchell, you found somebody willing to pay you $7 million a year to play your favorite game, and you're not even good at it. So celebrate (laughs) what you've got. This is a windfall, right? (laughs) Now, all that's true, and Mitch has to decide this weekend, what am I going 
to do? Am I going to look at all that's bad, or am I going to recognize there's also, amidst the rubble, some incredible walls of beauty that I want to celebrate? You know who was so good at finding the beauty in life was the great woman out of American history, Helen Keller. I mean, if anybody had a reason to say life is awful, everything's bad, it's a woman who was, who was deaf and blind, trapped in a world of silent darkness. And yet, she was always finding beauty and her heart was exploding with joy. Let me read a quote from Helen Keller. She says, I, who cannot see, find hundreds of things to interest me through mere touch. I feel the delicate symmetry of a leaf. I, press, I pass my hands lovingly about the smooth skin of a birch or the rough, shaggy bark of a pine. I feel the delightful, velvety texture of a flower and discover its remarkable convolutions and something of the miracle of nature is revealed to me. At times, my heart cries out longing to see things. If I can get so much pleasure in mere touch, how much more beauty must be revealed by sight. And yet, those who have eyes apparently see little. The panorama of color and action which fill the world are taken for granted. It's a great pity that in the world of light, the gift of sight is used only as a mere convenience rather than as a means of adding fullness. Wow. Friends, do you have a heart, a disposition like Ellen Keller? Have you learned the art of finding the beauty in the world all around? Or like that description, are you growing blind to all that's good? May God help us bend our tendency to obsess with all the problems, which are inevitable. You know, Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. You live on a broken planet that's rebelling from God, and there's a lot that's bad as a result. But will you instead say, I also know that the goodness of God, the beauty of creation, simple beauties are all around, and I want to enjoy them. I want to fine-tune the skill of finding beauty. Let's go to the next slide. There's one more. So don't wait. Decide you're going to find beauty today, but then enjoy it with God. See, that's what Thanksgiving is all about. It's not just dedicating the wall. It's dedicating the wall with songs of thanksgiving. Songs of thanksgiving are directed to God. You say, Lord, you're the giver of this wall, and we want to sing in celebration to you. You know, our whole nation this week is celebrating Thanksgiving, and yet many are atheists. And I've always been curious, you know, what are you, who are you thanking on Thanksgiving? And they would say, well, no one in particular. I'm just having a genuine spirit or heart of appreciation and gratitude for what I have. And that's good, but it's not as good as looking in the eyes, the giver of all good things, and saying, I celebrate and thank you in the midst of this awareness of what you've given. Remember James 1 says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Lord, you've given it all, and I give you thanks. I was reminded of the importance of enjoying it with God recently. Earlier this year, we went to Tennessee to see some uh, longtime friends and to their city of Gatlinburg. And they told us, we are very proud of our aquarium in Gatlinburg. In fact, many have said it's the best in the whole nation. Can we take you? And I'm like, sure. I was blown away. Friends, there are creatures in the sea that I never knew existed. I mean, I'm standing there going, are you kidding me? I mean, these like, colorful blobs that are swirling around and dancing with light. I am like... I've lived 51 years and watched National Geographic, I don't know how many times, and I never knew these things even existed, you know? And, and I realized I wasn't the only one just marveling, enjoying the beauty. We were all in this aquarium saying, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to find beauty today, and I'm going to enjoy it. But I do think I may have been one of the few who was enjoying it with God. That aquarium became a sanctuary to me that day. 
I just was in prayer the whole time I walked through. I was looking at things going, Lord, I never know you made this. What were you thinking? This is the strangest thing. I mean, it shows your way out there creativity, your sense of humor, your ability to think of what no one else would think of. I felt like I got to know the artist a little better by seeing works of art that I've never seen before. And with each seahorse and ray and everything, I just talked to him. I'm like, Lord, brilliant. Beautiful, shocking, amazing. Can I, what can I say, Father? You are just going through the art museum with the artist is the best way to enjoy art and to just tell him, thank you for making this. It was a spiritual journey that day, and it can be every day if we enjoy it with him, giving him thanks. This is the plan. This is before this thing has actually started. But now let's turn to when it starts. How did this day of festive celebration go down? Verse 30, when the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, they purified the gates, and they purified the wall. This is really interesting. They said, before we can really celebrate... We need to get in touch with the purification that God brings. And you want to, how do you purify a wall? Well, let me tell you. Uh, in other passages of the Bible, it becomes clear that they would get hyssop. It was a plant that's very prevalent there. And they'd bundle up a bunch of it. They'd get a bowl and they'd go to the temple and the, uh, the altar where animals, innocent animals, were sacrificed. They'd collect the blood of the sacrifice in the bowl. They would take the hyssop and they'd put it in the blood and then they'd come up to a wall and they'd go like this. And as you can imagine, the blood would splatter on the wall. And they'd say, it's ceremonially clean. And they'd go to the gates and to the people. People have sprinkles of blood on them. And the priest would say, because of the application of the sacrificial blood to you, you are clean. You're forgiven. You're pure. And I can imagine inquisitive children asking the priest, I don't get it. Why is blood on us from this innocent animal, poor animal that died? He did nothing wrong. Why is that leading to us being forgiven? And the priest would have to say, Honestly, I don't know, kid. I'm just doing what I'm told. And God told us for a long time that the innocent animal has to die and that we should be punished, but it's going to get punished and suffer the death penalty on our behalf. And somehow applying that to us leads to our forgiveness. I don't get it either, but that's how it works. And we get it because we live now with perspective, realizing that the whole sacrificial system was a means by which God was preparing his people to understand the work of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus arrived, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And sure enough, he went to the cross. He had done nothing wrong, but he was sacrificed on our behalf. We deserved the death penalty. He bore it in our place. And as a result of him satisfying justice, when we ask for that great act to be applied to our lives, God does, and we're forgiven forever. You know, it says in Hebrews 10.22 that we receive the sprinkling of the blood of Christ unto us. Friends, if, if you want to celebrate Thanksgiving, you're like, give me something good. I'll tell you what's good. Though you don't deserve it, you have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and you are forgiven of everything you've done. It's washed away and gone and you are right with God forever. I mean, we will dance through eternity in celebration of that one fact. And yet, I can't help but realize that there are people at all of our campuses who truthfully have never asked for the blood of Christ to be sprinkled on them. You know, you're trying to be good and trying to honor God, but your hope is still that your merit, your love and kindness and good deeds will somehow get you right with God. And the Bible says it never will. 
The only way to get right with God is to ask for the blood of Christ, his sacrifice, to be applied to your life. And so right in the middle of the sermon here, I want to pause in prayer and give an opportunity to anyone who somehow missed that to turn and say, yes, the sacrifice that Jesus did, I want that blood applied to me. Jesus, sprinkle me with your blood. Forgive me of my sin. You're my only hope. So let's do that. I'm going to pray right now. But it's the Lord listening to your silent prayer that matters. Christ, we believe that the greatest thing we're celebrating is forgiveness, washing away of our guilt, shame, and sin. And so right now, Jesus, you died for the sin of humanity. And we ask, sprinkle it on us. Apply it to us. Please, Jesus, forgive us. And make us right with God forever. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And to all of you who prayed that prayer, brilliant. That was the wisest step you will ever take. And there's reason for thanksgiving each and every day for the rest of eternity. But this connection with their purification is just the beginning of the celebration on that day. Let's look what happened next. Verse 31, Nehemiah speaking. He said, I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. You'll see I've highlighted those words because this concept of giving thanks permeates this, this day. On one choir, or one choir was to proceed on top of the wall to the right, and the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. On top of the wall? Yeah, they've excavated parts of Nehemiah's wall in Jerusalem, and it's huge. It's so wide that there's literally a road on top of it. And so you got to imagine that a parade of the finest instrument players in the land, the finest vocalists in the land, People just dancing and singing. One parade went around on that top of the wall this way and the other this way. And the whole city was surrounded by celebration until those two parades met on the far side. Verse 39. At the gate of the guard, they stopped. Apparently, that's where they met on the far side. The two choirs that gave thanks. There's that concept again then took their places in the house of God. After the parade, they all entered into the temple to continue their celebration. Verse 43. On that day, they rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. What a beautiful verse. You know, this verse just helps us see how powerful this joy from thanksgiving can be. In fact, let me point to three things that I see about this joy of thanksgiving. Number one, it's, it's miraculous, meaning God brings it. On that day, they rejoiced. Why? Because God had just given them great joy. You know, the Lord saw them in their desire to connect with the beauty of the wall and to give him praise and thanks and God said, oh, I love what they're doing here, and I'm going to bless their effort with an infusion of joy in their hearts. May God do that for you this Thanksgiving. May he see your prayerful effort to reflect on the beauty, find the beauty, and to enjoy it with him, giving him thanks. And may God say, hey, let's infuse some supernatural joy into them this Thanksgiving. That, that joy is miraculous. It's God-given. Not only that, it's contagious. If you recall, it was the priests, the Levites, who started the joyful celebration. But this verse mentions that it went beyond the men. The, the women and the children also rejoiced. They couldn't help it. They were just drawn in to the joy of the moment. Have you noticed the contagious nature of People who are just so excited about life, who see the beauty, who point it out, who reflect on what God is doing. It's contagious. You find yourself going, yeah, they're right, and you're drawn into it. May the contagion spread around your Thanksgiving table this year. 
And may it start with you as you just bubble over and others are just brought in by your example. There's one more. This joy is attractive to those outside the family of God. Did you catch this phrase? The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. In other cities, not the people of God, they could hear it. They're like, what is that sound? Some guy's like, yeah, I think that's Jerusalem. Sounds like singing. Yeah, they're singing songs to their God. They think God is the one who's blessed them with his wall, and obviously they're really happy about it, and they're like loving on God. And Do you think it's true? Do you think God loves them and that he has blessed them? Boy, it'd be fun to be a part of that, huh? Do you see how it's so attractive to those on the outside? And so it is in our lives. When people outside the faith see Christians who've just got the zeal, this fire, this sparkle in this eye, this enthusiasm for the goodness of their God in the land of the living, people are like, what's up with you? And you're like, man, don't you see it? God has been good to us. And friends, that is so attractive. They are drawn to the fullness of life that Christ can bring. And folks say, I want in on that. May God use all of us, the people of the Compass Church at all of our campuses, this Thanksgiving and beyond, to live a life increasingly marked by the joy that this art of Thanksgiving can bring. And may it be used as a perfume, light, to a dark world to draw them in. All right. So, Friday night, I got a chance to try to practice this. Uh, I, I came home, and I'm like, darling, what's for dinner? You know? And my wife says, I'm throwing a frozen pizza in the oven. And this cardboard pizza was uh, served up. Wouldn't you know, right then, I get a text from a group of my friends, friends that I've had since high school, who are downtown Chicago, and they're sending me pictures of them wear, dressed to the nines. They're in their fine, they're at a very fancy restaurant. They're holding up glasses of wine going, hey, Jeff, miss ya. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're just rubbing it in my face, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, am I a loser or what? You know, they're living the high life, and there I am. And I'm, whoa, what am I doing? i got to practice what I'm preaching. got to enter into Thanksgiving. So I did, very intentionally. I, I said, all right, first of all, a Friday night off is a gift, right? I mean, I've worked hard, and here I've arrived, and i got a family to celebrate and enjoy a Friday night off with. And so I'm going to view it as a gift. And I turned in prayer, and actually as we prayed at the meal, I said, God, we thank you for this night to be together and to just have fun. After pizza, we said, hey, movie night. Jake, you get to pick the movie. And, and Jake was like, battleship. He found this movie that's uh, like violence and war and high action. And we were all like, okay. We said, you can pick the movie. He was so excited. He was like dancing. And I'm like, Lord, you made my boy like that. And his over-the-top exuberance is a beautiful gift from you. And I give you thanks for how you wired this kid up. And then we were watching and enjoying the movie. And I you know, said, hey, popcorn. How about popcorn? And I made a huge bowl of popcorn. How many of you have thanked God for popcorn? <laughs> it's a miracle. I, just, I had never thought, thanked God for it before. But I started thinking about it. These little rock-hard pebbles that are, you know, inedible, you heat them up, and suddenly, like a miracle, they just, boom, they turn into these fluffy, globular balls of toasted goodness, and you sprinkle some butter and salt on them, and you're a happy person, you know, and I'm like, Lord, we all, you know, just watch the movie, and we thank God for popcorn as we enjoyed it. Uh, that evening, uh, Janae climbed into bed. And Jen, just filled with love for her daughter, jumped into the bed right next to her and wrapped her arms around Janae. 
And I came by and saw this cuddle fest and didn't want to miss out, so I jumped on the other side of Janae, you know, and grabbed onto her, and Jake heard the squealing and came running, and he did a swan dive onto the top of us all. That poor bed, that little bed just about lost life, you know, that thing. Now, my family is far from perfect, but in that moment, as we all held on to each other and felt the love, I said, Lord, this is a gift. These people are a gift. This love that we have for each other is beautiful. Thank you. I worship you. And I got another text from my friends partying in the big city. And they said, wish you were here. More pictures. And I thought, I'm glad I'm not. In fact, this thought crossed my mind. I go, I think. I don't know. But I think there is more joy in my heart in this simple art of thanksgiving than in the high life in the big city can ever bring. And friends, may you and I together get better and better at the art of giving thanks. May we just explode with joy in the simple blessings of God both this Thursday and forever beyond. Let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, you've been so good. Forgive us for just whining and complaining with preoccupation about the bad. We do. It's okay we know to weep, but we want to dance as well. There's some weeping in the rubble, but may there be dancing on the wall as well. Make us wall dancers, God. Teach us to be those who see beauty we previously overlooked. Teach us to enjoy it with you giving you thanks and praise, and may you infuse your joy in our hearts this Thursday and beyond. May the Compass Church just be a place of shocking joy that draws others to this life Christ came to bring. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.